think we're having heat problems, y'all. Listen to that. Those are angels. Huh? Those are angels. <laughs> angels? <laughs> We will fix that in just a second. All right, turn your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want to start here and read just one verse. And uh, I will say up front, I'm going to be taking the verse somewhat out of context. Uh, but really, I'm just using it as a statement about uh, God and how He works. Uh, we have been uh, looking at the last four or five weeks uh, the doctrine of basically how we live or how we should live. We looked one week about uh, our, our walk. Paul mentions our walk 13 times in the scriptures. Uh, Paul mentions good works 12 different times in his epistles. And I've pointed out on several occasions how that Paul puts as much emphasis on our walk as he does our salvation. And it's because of how the importance of that. And what I want to do today is try to show you why that is important. I mean, why is it that we have the instructions from the Apostle Paul that we have in regard to how we live? We have instructions about our eternity. We have instructions about how we are saved. We're saved by grace through faith. And then Paul turns in most all of his epistles to our conduct, if you will, uh, and instruction in regarding our walk. And so today I want to talk to you about the plan, if you will. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 13, one simple statement, and this is in the context of speaking in tongues, or the, the charismatic stuff that goes on there. He says in verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God is not the author of confusion. God always does things in a systematic type way, he always has a plan, and it's his will that that plan be executed without overriding the free will of man. If you go back through your Bible, it's, it becomes obvious uh, what God's plan was at different times for different people. For example, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. That's about as far back as you can go, isn't it? God had a plan. He put man and woman in that garden. He gave them some specific instructions. And the idea was that he was going to populate the earth with a perfect people. But he gave them a choice. And by the way, the reason he was going to populate the earth with a perfect people had to do with the fall of that old serpent, the devil, Lucifer himself. And that's another study it all together. I mean... You can, we can go in and look at the, the, the throne of God and those around the throne and how there was rebellion and all of that. But I believe the creation was in relation to all that and it was to, to show that God had a plan for mankind uh, and that plan was to create a perfect people or to have a perfect people. But he gave them free will. And we know that man, not God, messed up the plan, didn't he? Some thousand years, 1,500 years later, in Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, God looked down and saw the imaginations of men that every thought was only evil continually. And so what did he do? He had a plan to destroy all of mankind, save Noah and his children. <coughs> And so God initiated that plan. He brought the flood. And after the flood, he gave Noah and his sons specific instructions. What was that? You're to go out and replenish the earth. Go out into all the earth and replenish the earth. Multiply, he said. And so you get over to Genesis chapter 9. 
Uh, let's just flip back there. Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, uh, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Then you get over to chapter 11. The Bible says the whole earth, verse 1, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They are in direct rebellion of what God told them to do. Go into all the earth. No, they said, We're going to stay here. We're going to build us a tower uh, that can reach all the way into heaven. And so what did God do? God confounded. Verse 6, the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Notice that word imagine. God looked down in Genesis, saw, Genesis 6, saw the imagination of man. Now, he says, go, let, let us go down, confound their language, that they might understand, may not understand one another's speech. So he separated the people. You get over to Genesis chapter 12, in verse 1, the Lord God, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So God's plan there was to separate Abram and his descendants from the rest of mankind. And he goes on to say, in verse 2, I will make of thee, of Abram, a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. <laughs> it's almost like God said, this thing ain't going to work with all of mankind, so I'm just going to pick out one man here, and of him I'll make a great nation, and I will bring about my plan upon earth, through this nation. And that's what Israel's plan was. God's plan for Israel is that they would be the instrument that would carry the message of salvation about a coming kingdom to the world. And we see that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the teachings of Christ to the twelve. So God calls Abram and he, he, and he separates Abram. And Abram has two sons, and we see the working out of all of that and uh, how God continues his plan. And then the nation Israel, they glory in the fact that they are God's chosen people and that God has given them the land. <laughs> Here we are some 6,000 years later, and what are they fighting over? The land in co contrary to God's plan that it would belong to his people, Israel. And so Israel became dissatisfied. God gave them the law. Moses said, these people are turning against you, God. Uh, I can't govern them. Why don't you just destroy all of them? And God said, no, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do, Moses, and he gave to Moses there on the Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. And in addition to those ten, a whole list of around 600 commandments. And the nation Israel, they heard that, and they say, these are the commandments of our God, and we will do them. Pretty proud people, weren't they? And they didn't do them. And God up repeatedly dealt with them, and his wrath, in many instances, came instant, but Israel remained his people. And so 
all the way through the Old Testament, God has a plan to establish a kingdom upon this earth. And he calls it the throne of David. And so when you get over to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four chapters in the New Testament, we see the fruition of all that in the coming of Jesus Christ to earth. The one who was going to sit upon the throne of David and rule with a rod of iron. But his own people rejected him. The Bible says he came into his own, but his own received him not. Why? Because they were expecting a king. They were expecting him to ride in on a white horse. He came in on a donkey, if you will. He was not the king that they expected. But he proclaimed himself to be the king. And so they rejected him. God's plan was for him to establish his throne and rule upon the earth. What did they do? They killed him. They put him to death. But God was not going to be foiled. He raised him up on the third day. And after 40 days of instructing the 12 about carrying out this ministry, he had trained them to do for, 33, for three years, starting at age 30. Uh, the ministry of Christ was about three years. And he instructed them for three years. And then he basically has a hand-on-hand -hand seminar with them for 40 days, instructing them about what they are to do. And for time's sake, we're not going to read it. But if you want to start reading in Acts chapter 1, over to Acts chapter 9, you'll see that the 12 are trying to initiate that plan. But again, in Acts 7, when Stephen preaches this murder indictment to them, what do they do? They again reject him. They kill him, if you will. They stone him to death. And they're standing, holding the coat of those that stoned him, is a man called Saul. And so in Acts chapter 9, we see that God still has a plan. And that plan is to save this Jew who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, who said in Philippians chapter 3, as touching the law, I was blameless. He saves this Jew on the road to Damascus. And he gives Paul what the Bible calls the revelation of the mystery. And that revelation is, if you want to put it in very simple terms, is that God is no longer dealing with with Israel as a nation. Look over in Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11. Paul is on the road to Damascus. He's struck down there. And he said, he, he sees a bright light from heaven. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord replies, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. At that moment, I have to believe that Paul was struck with fear because in all reality, Paul was worthy of death. He had blasphemed the Holy Spirit when he spoke against the Holy Spirit by rejecting the ministry of the Twelve, declaring that Christ was that Messiah. This same Jesus whom you've crucified, Peter said, he will make both Lord and Christ. So Paul gets saved and he goes into Arabia and spends about 13, 14 years. A lot of times people kind of discount that. They forget that that happened. And during this time, the Lord reveals to Paul a lot of information that was not previously made known. And that was that the law would be taken out of the way or had been taken out of the way. It was nailed to the cross and now Paul was delivered this message of grace that had been a mystery that God would save anybody, not just Israel, not just those that came to him through Israel, 
But any man who would believe that his son died for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day, that God would save them on the basis of his grace. Now, in 12 minutes, you've had a refresher of the entire Bible. <laughs> Amen? I mean, that's an overview. And every part could take hours and hours and hours to expound upon. But that's God. The point in all of that is God has a plan. And he had a plan when he saved the Apostle Paul. And thank God that plan included people like you and I. Look over in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2. Now I want you to just stop and think. Before we read in Ephesians, look over in the, the very next book in Philippians. Here's Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul believes with all of his heart, soul, and mind that he is doing the work of God by killing those who are proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. Because Paul was like the majority of the other Jews. He did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah either. He thought he was a fraud. And yet when he appeared to Paul from heaven. After that moment there was no doubt. When he said I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Paul was a. Let's, let's, well we'll just read it. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath wherever he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is of the law, blameless, but what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Now before we read Ephesians chapter 2, go back to Roman, go to Romans 11, where I told you a moment ago. Y'all all thought I forgot. And I did. But I remembered. So Paul starts his ministry. And he goes to the Jew first. Then to the Gentile. But he does not go preaching the law of Moses. As a matter of fact in Romans chapter 7. He said we've been delivered from the law. And that's what I was talking about. That's the reason I read Philippians 3. Think about this man. Who is known by the masses. As one that's carrying out the work of God by killing these men that say they have a Messiah, Christ was him, and so forth. And all of a sudden he says, we're not under the law. Well, to most Jews that was blasphemy. He's saying no longer are you God's, are, are, are you God's specific people, but now the Gentiles can be saved in the same manner as you're saved today. And so when he writes the book of Romans, the first three chapters, first two chapters, it's, it, the basic premise there is we conclude all under sin, both Jew and Gentile. Romans 3, 4, and 5, we're justified by grace through faith. 
Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore be justified by faith. We have peace with God. Last week we looked at Romans 6, 7, and 8 uh, in just an overview of those. And so you get over to Romans chapter 9, and the natural question would be, if you were people there at Rome reading this book, what about Israel? I mean, we got the Old Testament. We read where they're God's chosen people. We read where they're going to rule and reign on the earth. There's going to be 12 tribes, and they're going to, uh, the 12 apostles are going to say, What about all of this, Paul? What happened to the Jews? What about the Jews? God just forgot us? And so, in Romans 11 25, Paul writes this For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, sometimes people quote verse 26 and misquote it by simply saying, all Israel shall be saved. That does not believe that every Jew is going to be saved because he puts a qualifier. And so all Israel shall be saved as it's written. Well, how is it written? It's written that the deliverer shall roar out of Zion and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And he says, and this is my covenant to them when I shall take away their sins. So those that rejected the message of Peter, James, and John in the book of Acts, they died lost. They didn't die in faith. But there's going to come a day when God is going to appear, or Jesus Christ is going to appear, as it is written. You read about that in Zechariah chapter 12. When he pours out his grace and supplication upon the house of Israel. And one of the great misunderstandings today is that people teach that God is through with Israel. That's a prominent teaching in most of religion. You know why they teach that? Because they believe that we are now Israel. They say we're the church's replacement Israel. That we have replaced Israel and therefore we have all the promises of Israel. Well, I would ask them, how's that working for you? I mean, come on, folks. We don't have the promises made to Israel. Just go back and read them. The fact is, is that God, it, it, Paul said, Israel's blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, that does not mean that individual Jews could not be saved. It means that salvation as a nation will not take place until the return of Jesus Christ. And they can fight for another thousand years over there in the Middle East and it's never going to be resolved. It'll be resolved when Christ returns and rules upon a throne with a rod of iron and establishes his people there in that land. But in the meantime, here we are, we find ourselves living in the dispensation of the grace of God with the Apostle Paul and we find out we're not Israel, we're not replacement Israel, we're not uh, spiritual Israel as some say, we are the church, the body of Christ. Now, just having said what I said, can't you see how utterly Difficult it is for people to understand who we are today if you don't rightly divide the word of truth. If you believe you're Israel, if you believe you're operating under those promises, if you're trying to keep the law, that's total confusion. Because we have an apostle, the apostle Paul, who wrote 13 epistles to you and I. And in those epistles, what the very first week we studied, started these studies, we read Ephesians chapter 2. And that's why I want to go back there. Look in verse 11. He says, where, well, I say, well, let's go ahead and start earlier in the chapter. Verse 1. 
And you, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. We all would have to do with you Gentiles and us Jews. We all had our conversation in pipe and past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So what's the plan? The plan is God's going to save people today on the basis of his grace. Not on the basis of keeping the law, not on the basis of their obedience, not on the basis of offering a blood sacrifice, not on the basis of coming down and repenting the sinner's, repeating the sinner's prayer, on the basis of his grace. God, who is rich in mercy for his great, with, great love wherewith he loved us. Verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we, Jew and Gentile, in the body of Christ, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and two good works. That workmanship can be found in 2 Corinthians 5 when Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and two good works which God hath foreordained that we should walk in them. There's the plan. There's the plan. God has saved people today in his dispensation of grace. He's given them instructions through the Apostle Paul. How is religion doing? How are people doing today at that? Not very well. Because everybody's stuck back there trying to follow Jesus. Which we do follow Jesus. We follow him through the words given to Paul. And we are his workmanship. And we've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And notice the reminder Paul gives these Ephesians. Wherefore remember. Remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Who are called uncircumcision. By that which is called circumcision flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And strange from the covenant's promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh how? By the blood of Christ. Look in chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote it for in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body and protected as promised in Christ. How? By keeping the law? No. By the gospel. The gospel of Christ. was mentioned in Romans 1.16. It was mentioned in Sunday school this morning, Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now look down in verse 8. Paul says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. 
which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and power in heavenly places might be known how? By the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to, here it is, the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, God in his foreknowledge, he knew all about us, folks. He knew exactly who we were, what we were going to do, how we were going to act, and so forth. And so, he knew that we needed grace, and he sent a minister of grace. He knew we needed a sacrifice. And so when he offered his son up at Calvary, he became the sacrifice, not only for the sins of Israel, but for the sins of all men. And so today, we as ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ have a purpose. We're part of that plan. What is that plan? We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and all good works. Turn over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, in verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself what? A peculiar people zealous of good works. Now we do pretty good at being peculiar. How are we doing about the good works? We are a peculiar people. And, and think about this. The very thing that people say that grace teaches, Paul says exactly the opposite here. He said the grace of God that brings us salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Look over in chapter 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So God had a plan. Not only did God have a plan, He had a purpose. Uh, in 2 Timothy 1.9, He says He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. God had this thing all planned out. So well, why did God do all of this? Why did he create man with a free will? Why did he just create a person? Well, it all goes back again to the fall. I believe that every dispensation in this Bible is to show forth that man left to himself will always, in the majority, the majority will always rebel against God. And God is looking for a people. God created a people to be obedient, to obey Him and obey His Word. Who, is, who does that pertain to? Well, Paul said in Colossians 1.10 that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. He said, be, he said in verse 9, be filled with all wisdom and knowledge. In verse 10, you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. You know the nation thing about Paul's epistles? He deals just about with every aspect of our life, even in this dispensation, all these thousand years later. While you get over to Ephesians 5 and 6, he's got instructions specific to women, He's got instructions specific to men. He's got instructions specific to children. He's got even instructions specific to servants of that day. 
And he tells us in each of those, I mean, in, in Ephesians 5, 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 10, well, talking about women, well reported of for good works. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 21, he talks about men and what their responsibility is. Children, as I've mentioned, he even deals with how we ought to go about providing for our family. Not specifically, but he says, if any man doesn't work, neither should he eat. Well, just think about how different that is. When people say they want to follow after Jesus, are they going to follow the church of Acts 2? You know anybody follow the church of Acts 2? Well, if, if you do, then tell them to come here because they can bring your money and leave it here at the altar and we'll disperse it as we all have need. And sometimes our needs are different. You know, sometimes you need a Mustang automobile or whatever it is. They're not following that, folks. That was for a very specific time and purpose. They sold what they had. Why? Because the Lord had told them, take no thought for your life, what you're going to eat, drink, or put on. While Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, he said, there are those that are walking disorderly among you, and you ought not to even have company with them. And their problem is, they're refusing to work. And if any man does not work, neither should he eat. And he wrote to Timothy and said, if any man provide not for his own, especially those of his own household, he's worse than an infidel. Do you see how relevant Paul's teachings are today? as opposed to that kingdom doctrine. Nobody's following that kingdom doctrine. Well, there are some people who don't take any thought about what they're going to eat, drink, or put on because the government has assumed that responsibility. And I'm not trying to get political or anything here, but the fact is that people, if they followed the scriptures, there wouldn't have been a need for welfare. The families would have taken care of one another. How? By working. And I understand there's a need to take care of people that can't take care of themselves. I'm not being cold-hearted. I believe that there are uh, people that need help, and we should help them. And the government should. I mean, if they're going to help people at all, they ought to help those who are in need. And so there's the plan. There's the purpose. There's the preparation. We spent the first few weeks talking about that study to show thyself approved unto God. A what? Workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And then there's the provision. We don't do this. We don't. The work of the Lord is not done within our own ability and strength. The provision is God's grace. Look over in 2 in Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about giving. And he says in verse 6, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity. For God loveth the cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Now, the context there is giving. But the fact is, is that principle will always apply in that which we do for the Lord. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. He told Paul, when Paul prayed three times that the Lord would remove the thorn in the flesh that buffeted him, that is, beat him. He said, Paul, I'm not going to remove that thorn. But my grace is sufficient. And God's grace is sufficient. That's the provision. And then there's the pattern. And Paul was that pattern. And Paul wrote to Titus. 
And he told Titus in all things, showing thyself a pattern of what? Good works. He says, put them in mind to be subject to magistrates and powers. We read the verses over there about the good works. He told the T a Timothy, be thou an example of the believer. And to you and I, we're instructed to be an example of the believer. In other words, God has instructed us. God showed us what His plan is. He has shown through His Scripture that we are part of that plan. We're part of His purpose. As Paul said back there in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, he was just given this purpose of making known to all men this mystery, this wonderful truth. And we do it for two reasons, and really two reasons only. Number one is to show people how they can receive justification today by grace through faith, without works, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And the second reason is so that we as individuals can walk worthy of the vocation. And people need to see that they're not under the commands and the demands of the law to please God. Most all of the law operated on what you can call the if system. If you will do this, then I'll do this. If you will obey me, then I'll bless you. If you do this, you'll have health. Think about this. God promised Israel health, wealth, financial success, all of that, and yet they rebelled. So he gave them a law. And he told them what would happen if they obeyed the law, and he said, you'll have all these blessings. But then he said, if you don't, you're going to have all these curses. Jesus Christ became a curse for us. What's going on in your life today is, is not a result of God's cursing you. And yet much of religion teaches people that it is. Why? So they can control them. If you came to church, if you gave your money, God would bless you. Well, let me tell you something. The Apostle Paul said, we've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Those blessings are a gift, just like salvation. You don't work for them, you don't earn them. And you know what? There's a whole lot of people out in this world, they need to know that. Because they're working their fingers to the bone. And as the old hee-haw saying was, all they end up is with bony fingers. You can't work enough to get God to bless you because he already has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. You see, we look at that which is seen. Paul said we need to look at that which is unseen. Amen. That which is forever, eternity. If you've never been saved, you don't have that hope of eternity. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you're lost. And God has made every provision for you to be saved and he made it so simple that all you have to do is believe that he died for you, that he paid for all of your sins at Calvary, was buried, and rose again the third day. And if you'll trust that, he'll receive you, not, the basis, not on the basis of what you do, but what he did. And if you are saved, you need to understand how important it is that you fulfill his plan and his purpose in your life day by day. I thank you for being here this morning. I appreciate your attendance and your attention. For those that have tuned in via the internet, we certainly appreciate you. And uh, those that are watching on the, our website, we're very thankful for you and I appreciate your faithfulness to be with us every week. Uh, folks, there's hardly a week goes by that I don't hear from somebody that has uh, listened to us. I got a, uh, a check this week from a man I've never heard of. And he said he watches us every week on the internet and wanted to be a part of this ministry. 
And so we never know the outreach, but it's there. And I thank God for the provision that's been made for us to, uh, us to reach out to other people through the internet, through Facebook, and share this glorious truth that we have because we don't want to keep it hidden. We want to share it with as many people as we can. And it all is our, all of our responsibility to be a part of that. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your love and your mercy and your grace. We thank you that you saved us by your grace through your faith. We thank you, Lord, for all that we have in you, the many blessings that you've blessed us with. And we pray, Lord, that we would be a part of your plan and your purpose to carry out the ministry of reconciliation because we are ambassadors for Christ. And I pray that you'd help us to uh, be an ambassador, be pleasing to thee and do it for Christ's sake. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mayor Day. We're dismissed.
Chair Mary. And I, and I went up and she was like, 